Okay, so today we get to run through some of your questions. It's a nice rainy day Q&A. And yeah, that's all I'm going to say right now. You just have to wait for the other side of the intro to hear what the questions are. We love when you guys submit your questions in the question box down below. It lets us know what you guys want to hear from us, and it lets us hear from you, which we really, really appreciate. If you guys enjoy this episode, share it with a friend. That's primarily how this podcast spreads, and also by you sharing reviews, which take a lot of time to write. Still need to write one for our dog trainer. So thank you guys so much for taking the time to do that. The Now That We're a Family Podcast. Well, as you said, Katie, it's a rainy day, and I'm I'm assuming that this, the rain's got to be showing up pretty voluminously. Voluminously? It's probably making a lot of noise on the audio side of things today, which we had to, we had to juggle things around here to get this episode recorded. Uh, you know that we've been recording outside as much as possible, and that's our favorite place to record right now. But then we also have the school tent that we will sometimes set up in. And that, even when it rains in there, that's just a canvas uh, top, and it's not as loud as our main tent, which is where we're at now, um, because of a variety of things. Well, namely Lionel's napping in the school tent. Um, and the and this we have a you know a plastic liner on this one that makes keeps it more waterproof but it is quite quite the noisemaker when it rains i will say this though i have been well one it's really fun to listen to the rain if you aren't trying to record a podcast yes amen and um, but two the other like the canvas on our tent tops are really like we haven't had any leakage in our other tent i know and we'll and we had probably seven or eight days of strong rain in this tent before we got the the plastic liner and we had zero leakage i i mean it's more of a long-term thing like we don't want it to get damp and really soak into the canvas all winter long or you think of the snow setting in on it that was kind of our thought with getting the, the plastic yeah liner. i'm still glad we did that what's funny is i was thinking back to the last time we weren't living in a house and recording the podcast and we weren't doing uh it was only audio at the time the first like three years of the podcast or four years of the podcast were only audio right and so it made it so much easier to just like sit in the car or just be wherever but with the visual right. aspect now we kind of have to set up so the kids are awesome they're just sitting all around here coloring and doing their math and uh, that's why we chose to do it here in the big tent so that right. we could have our kiddos inside with us and have the baby napping all at the same time so we're yeah. happy to be here this will be fun yeah, so far, so good. And it is cozy. I love the sound of the rain, like you said, when we're not worrying about recording the podcast. It's my favorite sound, like when we're going to bed, to the sound of the rain, sitting in here working, to the sound of the rain. It's very cozy. Yeah. Very cozy. Okay, like you said, we're going to do some Q&As. Are you going to go first, or do you want me to read off the first question? Do you have one that you want to go? I do. Okay, I do. Yeah, so this is from Suzanne, and she says she's been following us for the last four years. She's a bar part of the Get It All Done Club. Um, yeah, she's grateful to you katie for all the energy and time you put into encouraging um or she's grateful to both of us look at that for the time we put into sharing with our audience anyway so that was the preface suzanne thank you so much for that encouragement so um she has six kids nine and under five boys and a baby girl just like what we're about to be right no well, we way. Are. Yeah, we're currently fun. five boys and, and one girl and she said, I have a question i'd love to hear you address at some point if you choose to i have five sons between nine and three years old which brings a lot of competition this can be both helpful with how they push each other to run faster work harder or learn something new but it also brings a lot of tension because of unhealthy comparison and the younger ones feeling like they always lose how did your parents address this when you were growing up and how do you handle it this is a really great question because i do think it's really important when you grow up in a big family and there's a lot of one gender then you it's very easy for that competition to get unhealthy and obviously with my sisters and I, there were eight of us. We were all, yeah, girls. So it was a different type of competition that could crop up. But I think growing up, we saw in other families where the family was really competitive and the parents encouraged it. And in our home, competition, outside competition was encouraged. Like we were encouraged to like run races, do sports. Like our family was very driven and competitive and very proud of each other in competitions and how we would compete. But 
in the family, competition was not encouraged in a sense of who's better than who, or um, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't encouraged. It's, we're all a team here. So if your sibling does good, that's good for you. And you're looking out for the younger people. So like if we would all just go for a jog in the afternoon and we'd run a 5K, we'd always circle back. And this was a really big thing. So anytime someone's out in front leading, you circle back. Maybe you're racing for a time, so you don't circle back during the run, but you run as fast as you can until you get to the end. And then immediately you turn around and you jog back to the person in the back and you run them in. And that's just, I think it, that's one example, but it encapsulated the mindset that my family had growing up, which is we're all on a team here. We're all encouraging each other to do our best. You do your best, but all, but you don't push someone else down to do your best. You want your sibling to do their best too. And so I think that's something we're really trying to encourage in our home. And I'm really happy so far with seeing how the big kids see it as their responsibility, the big boys, to teach the younger boys and to bring along the younger boys and to show them. Instead of be like, hey, I'm bigger than you because I'm five years older, be like, I'm going to teach you how you can be awesome at this too. And I feel like that's more the mindset and the culture we're trying to cultivate in our home. Yeah. And Amen to everything that you just said. Uh, something that I think was a little different in my home that I don't think was bad was there were times where a sibling was clearly better than the other sibling at a given activity. Uh, and, and so you talked about like, hey, we don't, we don't say so-and-so is better or they are you know, faster or better at the piano or better, better academically than everybody else. We're all working together and cheering each other on. I think that we acknowledged, and I, and I think I would probably want this in my home, to, in, in our home. Yeah, is the acknowledgement of if someone's better, but you but you view it as a win for the whole family and everybody supporting that person. And I think that the reason uh, that that came up in our home is because there were we can we actually competed against our siblings outside of the home, uh, primarily at fiddle competitions and at all these fiddle competitions when we were in the same age group or the same division as our siblings, one was bound to beat the other one, right? We weren't going to tie uh, for whatever place we were going to get. And it never, uh, at least again, I'm speaking from my perspective, it was never difficult for me to acknowledge if a sibling, you know, beat me that day, or even if they were objectively better than me in general at say the fiddle. And it was really easy for me to do my best and then to celebrate when my sibling did well at a competition. And so I, I think I, I think you can do both, I guess is what I'm saying to say, hey, if one of our kids is just better at cross country objectively, you know, and they're running 30 seconds faster than than their younger sibling, we can celebrate that. But then it's a win for the whole family. And we don't need to be like, hey, so and so is better than you. So and so is better than you. Because I think that's how it was in our family. And I don't know if that's at all what you were talking about. Um well, I'm glad that you actually clarified that because that's not what I was talking about. I was saying more the gloating from the sibling side. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there was an acknowledgement. Like my sister, Kelsey, she's phenomenal at the piano. I took like 12 years of piano lessons and don't play anymore. <laughs> you know, Kelsey is our Foberg Music Academy piano instructor. Just incredible. And so it wasn't that others' gifts weren't celebrated, but it's especially at these ages it can be a bad habit to be like an older sibling has years head start on a younger sibling. So typically this isn't like, um, I think it's different when you're talking maybe high school, middle school relationships where um, giftings and skill sets and leanings are starting to come into play and kids are starting to specialize a little bit more. Um, Cause here at these ages, the older kid is always the best. Yep. And so it's more like in our home, we don't want to cultivate that, I'm better than you, right. loser. You yep. know what I mean? That's the competition that's never okay. It's like, exactly. yeah, of course you're older. You were born five years earlier. Yeah, of course you're better. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Uh, why don't you show him how to do what you just did? And so that's more what I was talking about. I'm glad you clarified because I do think it's also healthy to acknowledge that kids are going to be better at different things. And we all cheer each other on in the areas we're better in. But something my mom was so good at quoting was that scripture, it's better for another man to praise thee and not thine own lips. Mm -hmm. And we never want gloating in our home. Like, hey, if you're good at something, let someone else tell you. You don't tell someone you're good at that thing. Yeah. And gloating is never appropriate inside the family or outside of mm -hmm. the family. And it's really like a form of bullying if it's an older sibling doing it 
you know, over his younger siblings because it's like, well, like what you already said, you're just you're you're older. You're fit, and when it, the difference of a nine year old and like a five year old and physical development is astronomical. Uh, and so I think that there are ways to talk to the say that, well, one, teach to your nine year old. And we have to do this with our children as well. Uh, like, hey, we never taunt. We never gloat. That's just a zero. A, that's never appropriate at any point in your entire life, regardless of the context. Um, and then with the younger ones, if they are like, in the, you know, getting back to this question, feeling uh, deflated and feeling like they're always being, you know, beat or defeated in, in various activities, then I think you have to give. OK, real quick, if you're looking for music lessons for your family, piano lessons, guitar lessons, fiddle lessons, ukulele lessons, mandolin lessons, you can subscribe to Vopberg Music Academy and get lessons for the whole family. Subscribe to the piano course, one subscription, get you piano lessons for the whole family. Subscribe to guitar, that gets you guitar lessons for the whole family. We'll link it below. You get a special discount, and you can see that below by listening to our podcast. That's how you get the discount. Go check it out. Then perspective and context, too. And this wasn't a huge part of my life, but it was an element of my life because my the the next oldest brother above me is six years older than me, okay? So when I'm 10, he's 16, and I want to go out and play basketball with him, there was, I never felt good about myself, but there was the reality that I'd go and I'd go tell my dad, like, I think I'm going to quit basketball. I'm just not good. Joey beats me. He's just kind of like, what are you talking about? Like, you're, you're fine. Like, you're going to be do fine in basketball. He's six years older than me. And so he coached me through that, that mindset. Um, and so I do think it's incumbent upon the parent to give that perspective, both to the older sibling and to the younger sibling. It's, it's not giving a participation prize in the negative sense that we what we usually associate that with you know we just kind of like everybody's a winner but it's giving them actual perspective on like you're actually doing really good for your age like you there is a reality of like being the top in your category that is a real thing like we all are in some level of categories in our life and so your children are in different age categories when they're participating in things and you can tell them that and i and i've got no qualms when our kids are racing telling you know my third born or my fourth born like you actually did win your age group and that might sound that we're like giving everybody, you know, a blue ribbon just for participating. But I think it's slightly different. It's it's like if they're competing against somebody their own age and they get third place, I'll be like, you got third place. You were the third fastest. And we, we will still say that when our kids race or they compete, be like, yeah, so and so won. You know, you got fourth place, but you were the fastest in your age group, which is a real I think a real thing. Yeah, I think a lot of this has to do with perspective in the home. And that is the home is just not meant to be a competitive environment. It's just not. It's like that's where we are building each other up. We're growing. We're all on the same team here. And so I think anything that can facilitate that feeling of we're all on the same team and it's not a I'm better than you type of situation, I think the healthier family culture will be. And it, I'm a big fan of competition. I'm very competitive. So I'm not saying that all competition is is wrong or bad. But yeah, I would even say that it's not bad if there are elements of having your home be a competitive environment if you have the context of it being a team and you're all working towards the like-minded goal. Because even when you are on a team, a sports team, practice should be competitive. You should be pushing each other and trying to get better as a team. And I think that there can be fun competitions to create in a work project project to, to divide, be like, okay, you know, we're going to break into three teams here. You're going to weed this section. We're going to weed this section. And, and, and they're going to weed that section. Whoever can complete their section first, you know, wins. The person that's last has to jump in the creek or whatever. Like, I think we did stuff like that all the time growing up. And I think your family did too. But to me, that's not a competitive environment. That is, hey, we're all on a team. We're going to gamify this and make this fun. I'm not going to be, um, and maybe it's because this word competition has so many different connotations. But because it's hard, I don't think like gamifying something and competing in a fun way is what this mom's talking about, mm -hmm. um, which is unhealthy comparison. And I think that comparison game is just, there's never a place for it yeah. in the home. It's not like I'm looking at a ruler and pushing you down so I can get up higher on the ruler. Um, but yeah, having fun games, that's great. Or, right. you know, like we would... Definitely like in our scamps, when we would clean up after every meal, we would all go as fast as we could. But then as soon as you were done with your job, you went over to whoever wasn't done with their job and helped them finish right. as fast as you could. And it was like, we're all trying to finish before the timer runs out. There was a negative consequence if you didn't, but you weren't like, yes, my younger sibling's getting the negative consequence. I was faster. 
so I don't have to get it, you know? And so I think I see something that we hear a lot, which is really makes me happy is your kids really look out for each other. And I see that a lot with our older boys and our younger boys. And it's not like they're never at each other, but there is a lot of like, oh, here, you know, they just notice that they're having a hard time. They're running in the back to like help them with their hand or help them carry the wood over. And, and that's more the environment that I guess we want to facilitate. Yeah. Our home is not a critical spirit towards um, other siblings or tearing them down. Um, just always positivity, building other people up in the home. Yeah. And I, I agree. If it turns into comparison, uh, that's never a healthy thing. At, again, once again, at any point in your life. Uh, mm-hmm. And so you can actually view having closely aged children as an awesome opportunity for them to learn early that, hey, we can't compare ourselves to the person to the right and to the left. You really need to look at what the Lord's given you and be faithful in your tasks. Okay, You do need to apply yourself. Your working is unto the Lord Okay, in your sports, in your school, in your chores around the house. And because of development, because of uh, the way different bodies grow at different rates and different stages, it, there are going to come times where the somebody at with the same task as you, even at the same age as you, is just going to be faster or be better. And that's not you for yours to worry about. That's not yours to worry about. You've got to do your best. And so it is an opportunity, I think, to teach those principles because that's a lesson that you need to carry with you your entire life. It's not like once you get out of your home and you're not living with your siblings, you're never going to be tempted to compare yourself to other people that are around you in the workplace or in your church or just online for sure. And so the earlier you can learn that skill of, again, I would even say competing, doing your best, but then not comparing based off the the results. And, And that is a really fun thing to learn. And we continue to learn it is like, don't measure the, you know, the, don't measure the, um, don't measure the harvest you reap, but measure the seeds that you sow. And I think that that mentality can go into how you're teaching your children to compete and how you're teaching your children to, to apply themselves in academics. And, and I think that, uh, again, even as I'm hearing you talk, I'm reminded again of the difference of a boy heavy family and a girl heavy family, you know, because you guys were eight girls, three boys. We were six boys, four girls. And I think we found that even the vernacular that were you that we used in our homes was so drastically different. And, and I'll be the first to say our family had flaws, I think, in the way that we communicated with one another, but I I don't necessarily fully align with how you guys communicated with each other in the way that you guys did co- competition and challenged each other. Um, it was just far more feminine uh, because of the because of the girl ratio, and I think there's something to learn from that for sure. Yeah. yeah, so I think in your home, if you're trying to get away from something that you're sensing is unhealthy and negative, because you know as a parent whether that's a healthy thing or a negative thing, is to, um, I think something that my parents did a really good job of was putting us on the same team in a lot of different environments. And so it's like, if we all did a hike together, you know, instead of everything being age, age segregated, it was a really hard hike. And then we all looked around like, whoa, we all completed that. Like, You know, Lucy, thank you so much for helping out with your younger sibling when we were on that hike. You know, Louie, you did such a good job hiking. Lawrence, you hiked half of it all by yourself, you know. And being able to have the kids feel like they completed something as a unit. And as a unit, we are very strong. I think they're very good at doing this in the military. It's not like it's a non-competitive environment. But you see teams and they're teams and they're all you're only as good as the weakest link in right. the team. And so having that be the perspective of like, okay, when Boatbergs do something and we compete in this way, um, we're all really strong because we're a really strong unit together. When we do this work project together as a family, look how much we accomplish and just really feel, even at these ages, you can do this. I mean, just cleaning up your home can be a team building activity where yes. everyone's self, um, self-esteem is raised and they're able to look around and appreciate the effort that the other siblings are putting in on their behalf and helping them get the project done quicker. So I think the more that you can facilitate those things, the more you're gonna know that, um, the more you're going to maybe experience the healthy competition Elisha's talking about, and the less you're gonna experience what sounds like is um, not something that you wanna see in your home with this type of competition. Absolutely, yep, absolutely. Yeah, so we kinda, different perspectives there. I actually think our perspectives are pretty aligned. 
it's oh, just I like think they're way, they're way closer than what they're not. But but I do think because um, they think how we're raising our kids. This is all I should say. I guess when we're looking at our upbringings and talking about them, it sounds different. But the way we're raising our kids, I don't feel like we've had any friction on this. No, we're very aligned. Yeah. So yeah. that's where I think like we must have more of the same. Yeah. But, and it makes sense because there's always been tension when you and I have done, uh, com- like when you and I have been on the same team or we've been going against each other in competitive situations, you see the differences of our, of our pasts collide a little bit. I think we we have. I think like when we I did the volleyball league I don't together. I think you see the differences of our past. I think you see that we're both very competitive people. And the way that we engage in competition is different. We we are both very competitive, and I think that our families were very competitive. But the way that we uh, exemplified that or displayed that was slightly different. Like you guys, you uh, all I'm. Sa- <laughs> how would you How would you say that? I know it comes to my mind, but I'm not well, going to say. Like I, the most obvious is like you guys were on a volleyball team, and it's just so posi- positivity driven. We're just kind of like, you're all right. You got the next one. Like it's always it's always this positive chatter, and that has carried That's over. You learn on a high school team. That wasn't necessarily our family. That was. Uh, girl sports. I agree, and that's yeah. what I'm saying. I think that that characterized more of your guys' home culture than I would say even us being more of a boy-heavy family that were on basketball teams, we had basketball coaches. It's not like they we were just tearing each other down all the time. I think we were a lot more matter-of-fact about things. Or it's just kind of like, hey, yeah, you got to do better next time. Like, this is what this was what worked, this is what didn't. Like, pull it together and let's, and let's do it. And nobody would take that type of feedback personally and so i think that that i'm not saying that you got to go one way or the other i think that you and i are a good mix of of the two um but we definitely communicate differently in sports but i still think i'm talking kind of even outside of sports in this whole conversation i'm just saying like like in our family we sit around the dinner table and we don't have perfect communication but everyone would really talk out you're just really building people up. Yes. And so that's still an aspect of our home. Like if we have something like a project near and dear to our hearts, mm-hmm. we do share it. Uh, we know it will be positively received kind of no matter what by my family. Sure. Um, and every family has its strengths. But um, I think I was thinking not specifically how we communicate in sports because, yes, we have a very female sport culture and Elisha's like don't talk to me just let me worry about the next play so we do have tension there <laughs> <laughs> well I think even with when it came to music and music competitions uh we loved that it was it was a celebrated thing in our home we looked forward to traveling together to competitions to um to concerts to, to all those things and yet we were very I feel like matter of fact after after the after the after the scenario was over right or we'd be back and be like, oh my goodness, like I really need to work on this part and that. And you'd get that feedback from everybody. And it wasn't always this tearing down. It was just kind of like, hey, we we all acknowledged where we can get better. And yeah. So again, I think it was more of a probably a masculine feminine thing. Well, even, um, even with that though, I feel like we've talked, I feel like you've said that's something you don't want in your home. Is Is what? It's such a critical baby um, spirit. I with, I 100% agree. With um, it just that, oh, you that brutal honesty. Right. And that it, it can very quickly lean over into tearing down. No doubt. And so. Um, well, all I'm, this is what I'm saying. You know, I think our family. I'm saying leads, we've tried to not do that actually at our home. I thought that we've very much been on the same page. Of we didn't want the extreme. I do too. Don't recording no. this podcast. What I'm trying to say is, I think that we didn't want the full extremity of like you can do no wrong. You're a winner just by being alive. That maybe was more, you know, I guess was more of a characteristic. Not that's ext- that's an extreme. Yeah, that's okay. an extreme. we didn't want the either extremes of our families, and and I'll be the first to admit, my family leaned too heavily on the overcritical of one another. Even though I think we all knew our siblings had our best interests in mind, they were rooting for us. I think the way that that was communicated wasn't always all that helpful. And you can speak for yourself. I, th- I thought that we had both agreed some of the extremes that your family had weren't always that helpful in some of the circumstances and that we wanted something a little bit of both. Yeah. There maybe, go. maybe. I'm good with that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'll fully acknowledge that there were, that there were, shortcomings in the way my family communicated around competition and and 
but I, I just think they were different shortcomings than than what. Yeah, I yeah. I think when I so Elisha and I, we both don't no family's perfect. We both have loved our upbringings. We're both very defensive of our upbringings, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> um, which is great. And I do think we just have something for our family that's kind of a mesh of the two. Uh, and hopefully, you know, and then our kids are going to go, well, our family had upbringings and their spouse or you had shortcomings and their spouse's family's going to have shortcomings too. And that's where you just have to trust the Lord. But we're both very grateful for how we were raised, how Amen. competition was handled overall. Yep. And um, yeah, I do think we're more aligned than not. I think currently that. we're very aligned. Yeah. And how we're choosing to parent our children. I think yeah. where we have the di- disconnect is how we probably view each other's uh, yeah, totally, upbringings. Totally. You know, it was just kind of like, oh, I don't think that was. Yeah. Like you said, I'm more defensive of my upbringing. You're maybe more defensive of it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, hey, don't attack the way I was raised. Yeah. I feel like- Fall is here. A lot of us are kicking into new systems and routines. And the Get It All Done Club is for the woman who wants to stop drowning in motherhood and wants to start thriving. If you want to have more free time to do the things that you love to do and become more efficient at the tasks that you have to do each day, join the Get It All Done Club. There's thousands of women who have been through the program and who are currently in our private community that is off of social media. I'm in there monthly, live, answering your questions, talking with you guys, adding new content monthly. If you would like to get a little taste of what I teach in the Get It All Done Club and see a behind the scenes of what the program actually looks like, I do have a free masterclass for you guys. It's linked down below and it will teach you how to have a more peacefully productive home this week. Like I'm defending Hello. my parents' my parents' honor here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is good. That's how we want our kids to be, um, is we want them to be proud of the families they grew up in and thankful for them and grateful for them. It's so funny because <clears throat> this was something actually I had to learn growing up. What or Elisha really helped me, I should say, after we were married. So I say growing up, but I was 21 and we were married. <laughs> and I would, going through our dating and courtship, process and just being a young adult, you can get kind of critical of your parents. And I did, especially my dad during that time, I was pretty critical. And, but then anytime someone else would be critical of my dad, yeah. I would like jump in the boxing ring and like defend him to the death. Yes. And I mean, I still would to this day, but yeah. even though, even though my like emotions weren't there on my own side, like I could criticize him, but you can't criticize him. Right. And um, Elisha had to be like, Katie, like people have done that on my dad my whole life. You just have to let stuff go. Like you cannot take up every battle and <laughs> fight till you're blue in the face. And, and anyways. Oh, yeah. Like, I want to defend you, your parents, oh, you my parents. Too, but, uh, yeah. But sometimes people just say things that were like, I still remember someone, someone said this was their opening statement and they were trying to move on to another point. But they go, you know how your dad's kind of tyrannical? And I was just like, what the heck and like we never got on to whatever this person was going to say because i was so upset that they would say such a thing and i was like katie like people just say dramatic statements and you just have to let them move on to their point you know or you can still correct them if if you feel like they're like that's a a faulty statement you know be like well like why do you think they're tyrannical but yeah i do remember because people have been very critical of both of our parents right yeah i think that that is something that whether or not it's you know, I, I think that it, it can almost make us um, like calloused in a, in a negative way where you're not open to criticism. But in seeing my father, who is, it, you know, such a godly man, I look mm-hmm. up to him so much. He's led his family so well, loved my mother so well, um, you know, raised children, ran businesses, been a great employer to, to been a good leader in the community. That's like my, my take on my dad, right? Like that's who I would say, that's how I say that's how I say about him you know, are all those things and yet for my earliest memory him dealing with uh just criticisms from the right and from the left and and just kind of assuming like okay that just kind of comes with the territory if you're going to you know if, if the classic Oscar Wilde quote you know of uh if you don't if you don't how does it go if you don't want to offend anybody you just got to say nothing do nothing and be nothing um or at least it's attributed to Oscar Wilde. Yeah, uh, both our parents did a lot, said a lot, and yes. are a lot. And so that comes with a lot of comes with a lot of critiques. Yes. And I and I before we move on, yes. I have learned so much and I'm so grateful for the positive things I've learned from the way your family engages in competition and in sports and in building one another up. 
in their schooling, in their music, in whatever their business venture is. That's something that I really want to take from your home culture and, and, and apply a lot of that to our home culture. So the last thing I want you to think is all of the way you guys communicated growing up around competition is feminine and cheesy and and too peppy, you know, to a to a fault. That's not at all. Like it, I've learned so much, and I've been so encouraged by your family, and I've wanted to pass that on to others. Okay, because because as you already said, you know, I'm now far more quick to share new songs, you know, original songs or business ideas or you know projects that our family's working on with your family, even before my family. It's not because I don't care about my family's opinions. It's because I care so much about their opinion, yeah. <laughs> honestly. But I love running it by your family first because it's usually like a, a you know, a confidence boost. Um, and I'm like, okay, great. Like I'm going to continue with this. And then I feel like that gives me the confidence and the boldness to then take whatever type of might, might be helpful criticism mm -hmm. from my family. So I think there's a ton of value in the way that your family was raised around those things. And I'm big time grateful for it and appreciative of it oh thank you yeah <laughs> <laughs> and likewise i'm so grateful too i feel like your family i really feel like their culture is tempered like they just really strive for excellence mm -hmm. and that's something that i've taken away just wanting to strive more for that excellence and um yeah you do really push each other all to be better and i respect that mm -hmm. a lot so, yeah, I, I am very grateful. And even, even on certain issues, that is the thing. It's like, maybe I feel like that's just kind of how it goes. Maybe we feel like one of our families was healthier in a certain way. And then our, the other family was healthier in a certain way. And there's things like, you know, the stability that your family has provided me since us getting married or things like that, that I really, really value. Sure. Or I just feel like, oh, uh, because my family was just so uh, transient and excited about everything and lots of things, I just really appreciate the comfort that your parents have brought and the stability they brought to my life. So. <laughs> well, you didn't even say, I, I wasn't it's saying true, my thing. To the, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm just saying I don't want this to be like a, we both really appreciate each other's families. Okay. Big time. Respect the heck out of them. We're so grateful for them. I could not imagine a better upbringing and I couldn't imba imagine a better set of in-laws. Um, than my current, my current and forever in-laws. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Both grateful. Um, so see how I should, and I got competitive there. <laughs> yeah. No, my family's better my than family your family. It's better than your family when it comes to competition. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So hopefully our kids are better than we are. <laughs> um, Okay. I don't know about this. Just, okay. What do you think of the Empowered Wife book by Laura Doyle? Sounds interesting. Um, I'm going to... It's But this is the thing that I was going to comment on. It is seen as the most important book to read or follow by red-pilled women. And I just have to say, I don't know if I'm a red-pilled woman. Yeah, I don't know about any of those things <laughs> in the question. So yeah. I've got... I don't know what a red pilled woman is. I don't know about the book I, I'm Empowered not Woman really or the author. I'm confident about any red pills. Like anytime you hear someone explain like they're red pilled, or, I was like, you know what? Like I think scripture's really important and I think any pills outside of that make me nervous. <laughs> okay. So just just said I would love to read this book because I love to read different things that are controversial or you know, sure, hard hitting, influential. influential. Yeah. So thanks for the book recommendation. I will read it and um, I'll let you know. But yeah. I think sometimes because we have a biblical value system when it comes to marriage, people think that that automatically can mean red pilled, I guess. I'll put that in air quotes or like um, traditional, like I think the trad wife movement or whatever you say, oh, that's a biblical movement or whatever. But I'm not, I don't think that's actually the case. I think there's a lot of, um, even greater role separating that happens in a secular sense with traditional roles when people go traditional versus biblical than the Bible even has. Um, I think there's a lot more flex and room and creativity and space for um, collaboration in a biblical marriage than there is in maybe one would say a traditional marriage or a red pilled mm -hmm. marriage. And so I'm just, I'm not sure I buy into all that, but yeah, again, I don't, see. 
I don't. Does, nothing comes to my. Well, with red pilled anything, I don't know what that. Because is that like a? I think it's a Matrix reference, right? Yeah, it's a Matrix reference. And uh, this I've is actually never seen. I this is. I mean, yeah, Uncle Wade will probably forever begrudge the fact that. So I had never seen the movie, and he's like, "I got to show you the Matrix." So we sat down, and I fell asleep like twenty minutes into the Matrix. That's so that I've only seen about twenty minutes of the Matrix. So whenever people reference it, like in this whole red pill scenario like boy i like i don't really have i don't know what you're talking about but like who comes to mind for you just in like culture when you think of red pill well the first or, like, person the i names. thought of was andrew tate yeah so it's like <laughs> not a fan there yeah and so i'm like man i don't want his version of feminism you know like or or uh, or masculinity, or masculinity. Or... and so i i don't i i should pro because it's such a part of the cultural vernacular now i should probably find some working definition of what people you know on how people are using that term red pilled because it just doesn't it there's i've got no reference point for it it's not registering for me there's a lot of different connotations with the whole red pill thing and usually i it see it as extremities when it comes to masculinity and femininity not necessarily the healthiest versions of them or the god ordained versions of them but just like secular people trying to come up with, this is what a man is. He's like he man, and this is what a woman is. She's like ultra domestic. And I do think there is truth in both those things clearly, and that's why they resonate with people, the masculine and the feminine. But I think it's taken um, too far. Yeah, I mean, basically, the, what? Again, I've got no working definition, and so I've always based, I've tried to figure out what it is based off of who was talking about it and so basically if somebody was like talking about it in a negative way they're kind of like oh man you got to stay away from them they're kind of red pilled and i respected that person and then i'd be like okay red pilled's not good but if somebody said you got to stay away from them they're red pilled and i didn't really respect that person i'd be like well maybe i like red pilled and vice versa where where they're kind of like hey no it's, they're they're pretty awesome they're they're like more red pilled and i respected that person and i'd be like well maybe i do like this whole red pill thing and Likewise, if I didn't respect the person and they're like, yeah, they're great. They're, they're more red pilled. I'm like, what? I don't think I like red. So I've, I mean, I say it all to say it doesn't mean anything to me, I guess. Yeah. Basically I'm just, I'm not, I'm anti the pill. <laughs> and then yeah. it's just like, Hey, is it biblical truth? That's great. Is it not? Okay. Because under that, under the umbrella of red pill is a ton of secular ideas. Hmm that someone who's maybe thinking or going to categorize themselves as a red pill taker would then be ingesting. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Right. And you're like, if you take the red pill and everyone's saying, this is red pill, this is the smorgasbord. I don't like what's on the smorgasbord. I'm Got not it. saying there's not yeah, truth you're on you're the like, I don't want all that. It's the same thing, honestly, with feminism. It's like, there were some things that feminism got right. But maybe I'm like two. Two yeah, things. Two one. things. Okay. First, first wave feminism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First wave. Um, but I don't say I'm a feminist just because I agree with two things they did. Because the sure. smorgasbord is way too broad. Right. Way too anti-God and way too anti-biblical for me to embrace it. And I think that when I hear Christians saying, I'm red pill, I'm red pill. I'm just like, that is a very broad smorgasbord. Um, you might want to clarify um, what two things you're eating at the table. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the interesting thing about titles in general, and I think that whole, again, that's I feel like a pretty extreme title, red, red pill. But there mm -hmm. are less extreme titles that that still gets, it still is an issue that I I don't know where I, I land. You know, Republican, Democrat, conservative, mm -hmm. liberal, progressive, what like you know, far right, far left, and it's like man, I, I will claim t I will claim the title Republican for sure or mm -hmm. conservative or you know right politically when the option is when it's between two options does that make sense when it's between okay democrat or progressive or, or liberal it's like well no if those are the two things i'm i'm a republic i'm a conservative republican you know like and and i'll and i'll claim those titles even though there are probably things that go along with the republican title that i'm kind of like well yeah i don't i actually don't think that but I'll still claim that title. So I don't know if it's That's you can point. you can you can uh, say that across the board, you can't grab those titles. Um, That's a good point. But but I but I, I'm with you on the whole red pill thing or the feminism thing. We're like, well, no, I'm not those things. Yeah, you know, those are just two thing. things I reject because right. I don't I don't agree with the majority. I guess maybe if I agreed with the majority, it'd be easier. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I think I agree on a Republican sense with the majority yep. of where that leads. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. You can't, titles are helpful, but you can't necessarily claim everything that someone says. Yeah, and I think currently, so. yeah, yeah, and I think that they're, but I still think they're helpful. That, like we still naturally categorize as humans in our in our in our brain, and and I think that hopefully we always realize that even when somebody categorizes themselves as whatever reformed, you know, or charismatic, or mm-hmm. cessationist, or continuationist, uh, um, or or even another like more niche denomination within the Christian faith, they can be claiming that title. And still not adhere to what you see as being every single tenet of that mm-hmm. title. Yes, that's true. So I agree with what Elisha's saying. But to clear, just to come back to this point, I'm not red-pilled. I'm not yes. feminist. I'd love to read the book. Okay, do you have another one? I Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't read. I can read one, yeah. Okay. We go to a small, tight-knit church, and there's a family whose children continually behave in ways we're not comfortable with our children behaving, i.e. potty talk, playing rough, unkind behavior. Any advice? Well, I think this happens regardless of how awesome your friend circle is. There's going to be people you come in contact with that you're just like, I just don't want to raise my kids like this. Mm-hmm. And children are very impressionable. And so this is something, this has definitely come up. And we just have withdrawn from those circles. We've eliminated the amount of contact in those environments. Uh, as in, we don't put ourselves in those environments. And we just kind of slowly withdrawn um, into, okay, and, and now we see those people less. And so there's less, but they aren't like our kids' best friends that they're mm-hmm. seeing like three times a week or something like that, you yeah. know? And then we're... Uh, have replaced those with other friendships. So I do think that as a parent, it's a wonderful thing to um, be really gracious. If you're really close with the person, you know, if it's your sister, then you might want to talk to her about it and say, right. this, this is the reason why I want to take my kids out of these environments because I don't like how they come home and they're using these words or whatever the case may be. Um, if it's more of an acquaintance, you don't feel like you have that room to speak into their life and it just mm-hmm. come out of outfield and they're like, why are you critiquing my parenting? Then you might just, I mean, that's your prerogative as a parent is to just guide the social interactions another way. Yeah, that's actually really well said because I think you have to, on some level weigh the importance of the adult relationship uh, before you decide to withdraw or continue on with your children participating with their children. Because if they're, like you said, a loose, you know, or casual acquaintance, it might just be make the most sense for you to just kind of remove yourself altogether, like slowly, you know, just kind of graciously, just stop going to the events, stop going to whatever the, the, where you're going to be around those people. But as you said, if it's a, if it's a family member or one of your best friends, well, then you should have the conversation with them. Be like, hey, the, uh, like, especially if it becomes a point of contention where they're kind of like, why aren't you guys coming to this event? Like, you know, be like, well, here's the deal. Like, we really want to have this standard in our home when it comes to media or when it mm-hmm. comes to music or when it comes to, yeah, well, I guess music's media. When it comes to how we speak, you talk, especially in this scenario, just the conversations. And, uh, and, and that's, that's our home's policy. We're not even saying that you're living in sin at all. We're just saying this yeah. is like, like what we want for our children. And it seems to be counterproductive every time we're around, you know, your family again, easier said than done, but hypothetically that would be the something hopefully along those lines of the conversation. And that's come up in smaller ways within various friend circles or family circles where we've had to withdraw from certain things. It's brought up a conversation. We've had to have that conversation and people respect boundaries. And that's the thing when people, when you are close with a, a friend, a close friend or a family member or somebody, you know, from your church, they they want your hopefully they have your best interest in in mind they're going to respect that you actually have clarity for what you want your family culture to be and and again it's another awesome opportunity to teach your children hey this is our homes this is our family's policy on this stuff these are these are the boundaries we want in place for media for language and then be able to work with them when people are outside of that. Be like, hey, there's t- like we are still brothers and sisters in Christ. You don't need to sit back in the judgment seat and condemn them. I mean, you guys know we use a bunch of weird words as substitutes, like big job, you know, like bubble. Like those are <laughs> those are weird, okay, objectively. And so that's the standard. <laughs> Here's Louie over there. Hey, yeah. speaking of potty talk, daddy on the podcast. Exactly. And uh, hello. 
And so when we're around other Christian friends that don't use that same, again, vernacular for those categories, yeah. they're not wrong. It's just, those kids aren't, <laughs> right? And those families aren't wrong for using other words than what we use. But we, are, but we still get to choose what we use in our home. Um, yeah. when it, when it comes to language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I do think that something that really makes this easy, honestly, is filling up your social calendar with families and social events that are supporting the family culture you want. And that's a very natural and easy way for those things to fall by the wayside. Cause it's mm. like, oh man, we're already busy that night mm. or, we're already involved in a co-op with this group of kids, or we're already at a home group with this family, or this family's coming over for dinner that night. Um, so we need to kind of postpone how often we can get together. So having a very full social schedule for your children, for yourselves, that is just really enforcing your family culture is really healthy. And then when you go into those, you know, 10% of the time you're in those environments that aren't supporting and they're different than your family culture, like Elisha said, we still go into those environments. We're just saying, hey guys, this is gonna be a different environment. And the kids have a sensitivity to that because so much of their peer support is aligned in how they're being raised too. And so it, it um, rubs them wrong a mm -hmm. little bit. So they'll go into that setting and then it, it spawns good conversations for us afterwards. Cause they go, well, I was uncomfortable with this or so-and-so was talking about this or yep. what is this movie or all these things. and they notice the difference. And so it brings up good conversation. We're able to be like, like Elisha said, not condemning of someone who has a different belief system. Be like, hey, this is why we don't use that word. Um, or this is why we don't communicate in that way. It's just not really respectful or whatever the case may be. Because a lot of these issues with little kids, they are minor issues. It's not like these life or death situations, like they're doing drugs in the back. You right. know, it's um, little stuff that is subjective to our family culture and what we would want to encourage in our home. Yeah, and, and, and I think that that's a good point because if, if you know, your the, the other your friend's children are doing drugs or they're sneaking alcohol into their Bible study, you know, thing, that's the type of thing you talk to the parent, you address it, right? Yeah. That's an obvious one. But if it's, if it's like, hey, they're using profanity, that might be worth letting the parents know. Just be like, hey, just so you know, I heard you know, over, I was here over here in a conversation and like, I don't know what the context was, but they said these words, I don't know if you're cool with that or not. I mean, I don't even know if that's appropriate, you know, but like that oh, might be I the type of totally thing is. that yeah. like a parent, I would want, I would want a parent to tell me if my kids used uh, profanity, but then there's a whole other category of non profanity uh, words that like, you're just going to be around your entire life that are going to be happening in your church or not happening in your church. And I do think, you know, this is probably a time for another topic, another a topic for another conversation. But people talk about how you know boundaries and borders and um, you know fences, so to speak. They actually provide the opportunity for hospitality, and so because you know one might say, "Hey, no, put the fences down," you know. But the whole adage, you know, what is it? Tall fences make good neighbors. Uh, but in reality, as Christians, the more boundaries you have, the more it actually opens you up and opens up an opportunity for real hospitality. Say, hey, come over into my home. This is my space. And I think that can actually carry over into your own uh, values and principles. When you say, hey, these are all our values and and principles. It's actually not shutting you. If, you. if you approach them properly, it's not shutting you off from the rest of the world. You have to have a heart of humility and of grace and of, uh, you know, sympathy towards other people's upbringings. But being firm in your personal principles is actually helpful to being kind to one another, to having showing hospitality, to having understanding versus saying, hey, we don't really have rules in our home around language, media, you know, music, content. This is like rough and unkind behavior. Yeah, rough and, yeah, there's, we're not going to set any policies. That way everyone's comfortable or we can be around everyone. It's actually the, it has the opposite effect. Nobody's able to feel love from you or insight, but when you've got boundaries, you're able then to extend, you know, grace maybe even towards others or empathy or then be able to talk about why you've got the boundaries that you that you have in your life yeah and so even with this family you know sometimes what's helped us too is even separating out families so like Elisha just said having a family over for dinner in our home and then that allows our kids to get to know them and there's more like house rule type stuff so our kids could be like hey we don't we don't rough house like that here or we don't say those you know, you're talking about unkind behavior here. Um, our kids are like, hey, we don't, you know, do whatever this unkind behavior here 
is in our house, it gives your kids more confidence to be able to assert their opinion instead of like a third space too. Mm. And kind of be like, we don't do that here. Um, as well as you to be able to host and just have a closer ear to the ground as to what's going on and moderate if kids are being rough or unkind. And then the other thing is too, these are great opportunities to have our kids around um, rough and unkind kids, honestly, because it lets them know, hey, you don't like being treated like this. You know, right. when a kid goes, hey, he just sh shoved me down three times, like for no reason after church. And you're kind of like, well, here's the deal. You want to make sure you're never the guy shoving a kid down that's smaller than you. You know, make sure you aren't that guy because do you like him very much? No. So you don't want to be that way to someone else. So it can help instead of being like, oh, that is so, he's such a mean boy. Stay away from that boy or whatever. <laughs> Knowing that all our kids are capable of unkind behavior. Yes. Um, all of our kids are, are boys especially, but they're capable of being rough. And so letting them get the short end of the stick sometimes and say, hey, this is how it feels. Make sure we aren't doing that to our younger siblings or to someone else and kind of putting it on them as a um, option for them to grow out of that behavior can be good too. Instead of, um, you don't, I heard from someone one time, but it's like, you don't really want to pander to your kids yep. either when they get um, maybe bullied or roughed up or beat up. Sure. You just kind of want to let them deal with it and then either take them out of the situation or show them how they cannot be the one perpetuating that situation instead yep. of just like, oh, mommy is always here for you, you know? Yeah. And I think the same thing can actually apply to being around potty talk and being mm -hmm. around stuff that, cause that's not going to go away in your entire life. No, and so like, how are you the one that takes charge in the situation that changes the subject, not in a pious, annoying, well, actually I'm changing, I'm just going to stop using pious in a negative way because the most recent books showing me that piety is actually a very good thing. And it's in its actual, you know, I guess, um, Etym et a, when you go to the etymology of the world, word, it's very important. Etymological, maybe? The etymological I'm use of the word. That. Yeah, me too. But in a, in a stuck up, annoying way, you don't have to say, hey guys, we're not going to talk like that in an annoying way. I think you could, and even if you are, so, so be it. Like, right? You got to learn how to communicate with people because um, growing, like, as you become an adult, you're just going to be around uh, conversations that you need to learn to change, redirect, or remove yourself from right like we're kind of like okay i cannot with a clear conscience contribute to this conversation I, we, I either need to change the conversation for the room or remove myself from it and my dad taught us that at, from an early age because he worked for many years in a you know in a rough union environment where he's like man the, the conversations at lunch or at you know around the the workplace were just so bad um and so con you know just conflicting to my conscience i either had to change him and once that wasn't going to be the case then i removed myself from it and so it's a and like things like potty talk it's a great way to start getting your kids rep with those things just kind of like well did you join in did you laugh did you participate did you clam up you know did you start crying you don't need to cry right like you don't need to cry somebody uses that word like um and just kind of equipping them to be in those situations because they're going to be in them the rest of their life yeah and i'd say that depends on basically like is your child three years old or are they seven years old mm -hmm. like we have a different set of boundaries for like if our three-year-old saying stuff like that and our, right. is around little kids like that yeah he's just mimicking everything he hears he hears so it's like knock it off our older couple kids is a lot more like they're recognizing hey this is an environment that I know I'm taught not to communicate like this. So like Elisha said, that's actually great at those ages for them to be around that, to be uncomfortable in it and to come talk to us. Right. That's what we want because our kids are going to be in those environments. We want to be able to talk to them. So as long as they're telling us about them, letting us know they're uncomfortable, and then Elisha is able to talk them through kind of like how to behave in those environments, how to be a leader in those environments or leave or whatever. Um, that is just great life skills too. So never painting our kids as the victim, I guess, in any of these right. situations when they're really young being like, okay, you're just doing monkey see monkey do, we're getting you out of this situation. And then when they're older being like, how are you in environments where all the culture's going this way and you're going the other way? And how do you start repping stand doing something different than your peers? And the yeah. younger that our kids start doing this, I think the bigger that muscle is going to be when the things start getting bigger and bigger. So yeah. lots of options there, you know? <laughs> we just kind of said a ton of different things you could do. Uh, but you as the parent have to judge where is your kid and then make a call. Yeah. But feel confident making a call, I guess. You weren't a victim here either. 
Right. You're their parent. It might be uncomfortable. Your child might be uncomfortable. Uncomfortability is a part of life and relationships, and we all need to embrace that and get better at communicating through it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we can, we can call it a wrap. Okay, cool. that's it, you guys. Hey, thank you all so much for listening. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.